Gospels according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those whom you, from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good. And lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace you, Christ. Grace and mercy and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My text is the Gospel text, which was read from Luke chapter 6, commonly called the Sermon on the Plain, because it has a lot of similarities to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, except Luke tells us that Jesus gave this particular sermon on a very level place. And I think if you were stingy people, or if you were mean people, or if you were weak Christians that didn't care much or ask many profound questions about the scriptures, I'd probably preach this text a different way. But I have a particular take I want to share with you today. I want you to think about it deeply, this text. I hope I'll find a deeper place in your heart for this to take root. And uh, to be honest, if you've been coming to church for years or decades and you've heard sermons from the Sermon on the Plain or the Sermon on the Mount, I would guess that you have probably never heard a sermon looking at it from this particular perspective. Although I think I'm grounded in the text. I hope by the end of the sermon I'll be able to show you that. So here's Jesus giving this sermon. And you've seen the pictures of Jesus, right? He's got long hair, and he's got a beard, and he's telling all the people, he says it twice in this text, love your enemies. Doesn't that sound good? Love. Love. Love, love, love. Not all you need is love. love. Jesus could have been one of the Beatles, right? What a beautiful idea. What an idyllic thing. Even if it might be not realistic in the world, it's, it's such a precious dream, right? You may say, I'm a dreamer. See, Jesus could have been one of the Beatles, I'm telling you. There's something about that message of love. Love your enemies. And it just gets captured in songs. Gets captured in movies and poetry and literature, and we all like to think, oh, if only the world could be like that. And we value that ideal of how we should all love one another. And so, of course, Jesus gets a very prominent place because of his ability to stir that vision in us, right? He knows how to make us feel good, that we should all just be loving one another and loving our enemies. Everyone should love everyone. If only for a little while, is what we like to think. I want to dissect that here a little diff differently this morning and propose something else. Jesus says, love your enemies, 
Do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. Really? How far do you think you can go with that? Honestly, as your pastor, if someone came to me as the pastor and said she was being abused by her husband, do you, what do you want me to tell her? Do you want me to tell her that she should pray for that man? Or if someone comes and tells you that your child at school is being bullied by the other children, how should I advise them? Should I say, well, do good to those who hate you and bless those who curse you? Really? Jesus says, to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other. Also, it's where we get that famous phrase, you've all heard it before, turn the other cheek, right? Well, how's that worked out for you? Do you do that with the person at work who's trying to undermine you so they can get ahead and maybe get the promotion instead of you? Would you turn the other cheek if somebody starts a fight with you somewhere? Would you tell your kids to do that? Jesus says, from one who takes away your cloak, do not hold, withhold your tunic either. From one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. So we get all these scammers these days, right? People who are trying to get your personal information so that they can rob you. To be honest, you know, we all sin. All people are sinful. There's no one who is without sin. But I think those scammers have got to be, at least in my mind, the, 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 the biggest low-life garbage people on earth that you could ever possibly think of. Imagine somebody intentionally going through all of that trouble to bilk someone else especially some older person, out of all their savings. They don't care how thrifty you are. They don't care about all the things that you did without in your life so you could save up a little bit here and there, year after year, decade after decade, in order to get a little nest egg for yourselves. They'd be all glad to take it from you in a second, gleefully. Here comes Jesus, telling you that if someone steals your visa card number and is running up charges on your account, you should call them up and say, here, I want to give you my MasterCard number, too. <laughs> <laughs> give to everyone who begs you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. Now, you know, I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but I think in the broad scheme of things, just a general look at humanity, I think I'm a pretty charitable and giving person. But I have discovered in my lifetime that the more you give and the more charitable you are, the more lists you get put out of people asking for donations. Are you like me? How many calls do you get in a month that say, Mr. Oswald, this is Jason from could fill in the blank. The Cancer Society, the Heart Association, the Kidney Research, the Ending Alzheimer's, Police Fraternity, Urban Missions, Clean the Ocean, Stop Hunger, Save the Children, Protect the Animals, Preventing Poverty, St. What's-His-Name Baby Hospital, Doctors for Jesus, Orphan Rescue, Disaster Relief, Habitats for the Homeless, March for Peace, and on and on and on and on. They just keep calling you. How are you today, Mr. Oswald? Uh, I'm fine. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you for asking and then they launch into their spiel, and you can't get a word in, and they keep going until they're done. You can't interrupt them, and they get to the end finally, and they say, you know, in our drive today, we have three tiers of support, $75, $150, or $300. Which one shall I put you down for, Mr. Oswald? Uh, uh, oh, I, I'm not gonna be able to do that. I understand, Mr. Oswald. Not everybody's in a position to do that, but can we count on you today for $35? No, no, you don't understand. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Mr. Oswald, couldn't you just give $15 to me? Right? They, they don't leave you alone. They keep going and going. And I really wonder how many of them, if any of them, give the same percentage of their incomes that I give as a percentage of my income to 503 bs I'm really tempted to do this one of these days. And say, okay, I'll tell you what. You send me your tax return with your itemized deductions of charitable contributions. 
If it's a lower percent, and if it's a higher percentage than what I've given, I'll make up the difference and send it to your organization. If it's a lower percentage, you send the difference to my church. How about that? I haven't done that. I usually decide in advance where my charitable contributions are going to go. And it, unless the Holy Spirit really moves me, I kind of stick to that. You know, there are a lot of really worthwhile charitable organizations out there. And many of them are doing really good things. And the last I heard, Americans are sadly giving less and less to charity. It's becoming harder and harder for the good organizations out there who depend on charitable contributions to make ends meet. So we should be charitable people. We should be generous people. We should be giving people. And we should think of the needs of others. But according to Jesus, we should give to, did you catch that word? Everyone who begs from us. That's what he said. Give to everyone who begs from us. And does he mean by that beggars too? You know what? I can't stand those people. Oh, we've all heard about people who have real and legitimate needs and could really benefit by being blessed from us. But how many of them out there are just scammers? Or what about all of the people that are out there that when it comes right down to it, to be honest, you know why they're in that predicament? By their own fault. I really think that number's a lot higher than we suppose, to be honest. You know, where we used to live in Virginia, the Naval Hospital was in Portsmouth. So when you left the hospital, you went under the underpass there, and then you got on the entrance to the expressway, and right there was the, the tunnel. And it always slowed down, the traffic going through the tunnel. And so it came to a standstill, and there were always people standing on that entrance ramp asking for donations. Now, I did, it, I did the trip so many times that if, like me, if instead of watching the exit ramp and looking for your space to get on the expressway, if you happen to look this way, behind the utility building over on the side, there were always two or three of them over there drinking, and one with a little cardboard sign collecting donations. They took turns collecting the money. Or I can remember going once to a McDonald's there, and a woman came up, she was going from table to table, she came to my table and she said, could you spare a dollar for a traveler? I happened to go back to that McDonald's about three weeks later, and there she was again, going from table to table, saying, could you spare a dollar for a traveler? So I kept my eyes open every time I drove by that McDonald's. She was walking around in there. After a few weeks, the manager must have thrown her out. Then she was out walking around in the parking lot. She was a traveler, all right. She was traveling from person to person, collecting dollars. And we get it at church, too. You know, in my first year here as a pastor, I hate to tell you how many times people would call or even come by that needed some kind of help. And I would spend so much of my, my valuable time just generously listening to what they were saying, listening to all their tales of woe, and trying to see what I could do to help them and work through their problems. And a lot of times, I would just give them something for, out of my own pocket. There was a woman who came one time at the end of the day when things were already shutting down. She had lost her home. She had no place to live, no place to go. Now that she's finally at the end of her rope, she shows up at my door and she needs help. There was nothing else to do, so I gave her $100 out of my pocket for a hotel and said the plan is tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning we can call the county and we can start seeing what resources are available to help you. Of course, I never saw her again. Or there was the old man that was having trouble. I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I make birdhouses makes birdhouses, they're $90 each. But business hadn't been so good. I thought $90 each, no wonder business hasn't been so good. But I said, well, let me, I can help you out. Let me buy a birdhouse from you. He said, business has been so bad, I have no money to get wood to build the birdhouses. So I said, well, let me give you half, $45, and you build the birdhouse, here's my phone number. When you have it built, give me a call, and I'll pay you the rest and get the birdhouse. Never heard from him again. 
How many people have come that say, I have no place to live, my car broke down and I have no way to get to, to my job, or you like this one? My kids aren't going to have a good Christmas this year. You know what I started doing about a year ago? If the elders don't like the way I'm handling this, you'll have to straighten me out. But about a year ago, I started telling people when they came asking for something. I said, our social support for people in need, our, gearing, our, our effort with that is to try to help the church members. And you know what? They quit coming. Word gets around. I think they all talk to each other. And once they discover they're not going to get nothing from that white church on the hill, they don't call anymore. Word gets around. Does that make you feel kind of like if you are generous and you give to people in need? Maybe you sort of become a soft target, don't you? They kind of know who's going to give, and that's who they go after. I don't want to give you the impression I'm at McDonald's all the time, but it just seems to be where this happens. I went to a McDonald's once, and as I'm in there waiting for my food, a guy comes up behind me and asks for money. He looked pretty bad shape. I looked at him, I said, well, you know, I'm not going to give you any money. But I'll tell you what I will do. I'll give you some food. I gave him my sandwich and fries. He said, well, I really need the money. He said, well, I'm not going to do that, but here's some food. He said, well, I disagree with you, but I thank you for the food anyways. And I finished and went out to my van. By the time I got to my van and closed the door, I don't know how he signaled them or what happened, but there were two more people, one on each window, tapping on the glass, asking if I'd buy him some food. You know, to be honest, four times out of five, I just don't give to all these panhandlers. And when I do, four times out of five, I find myself afterward not really feeling good about it. Something in my intuition or my heart says that this just isn't right. There's something not good about this situation. I'm not getting it. But Jesus says, give to everyone who begs from you. Jesus says, lend, expecting nothing in return. Do you know what they call a loan that you don't have to repay? That's a gift. <laughs> what if you were a business owner and somebody buys some of your product and promises to pay, but the payment never comes? Do you send them a bill? Would you eventually turn them over to collections? Or would you say, Jesus said, lend, expecting nothing to return, and my reward will be great. I'm just going to let it go. Good luck with your business. Do you see the challenge here? Have you ever given any serious thought to just how radical these things are that Jesus is saying here? People who have given serious thought to it have, to be honest, tempered it in different ways. There's the kind of unsophisticated way of dealing with it. I remember a guy one time, he said, well, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. But I only have two cheeks. So if you strike me twice, the third strike, you're out, man. I got nothing to do with you. That's good. That's kind of an unsophisticated way to deal with it. But others are try to be more responsible. They say, well, these expectations of Jesus don't eliminate the need for us to be responsible and doing our due diligence and our giving so that we exercise appropriate fiduciary concerns in our stewardship of God's resources. But you know what all that is? No matter how you do it, when you start explaining it away, you start diminishing the radicality of Jesus' words, right? They all end up justifying the way we tend to do things and making it seem like Jesus isn't being that radical. So listen, I want you to see something here. It's critical whenever we read Scripture, and especially passages like this, that we read Scripture through the lenses of, you know what I'm about to say, right? Law and Gospel. Everything in the Bible is either law or gospel. Everything in the Bible is telling us either God's impossible demands or God's unconditional promise, what he has done for us. And our problem is that we immediately read a passage like this or the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain. We read it as a message about personal ethics, that Jesus is trying to tell us how we ought to behave. And as soon as you do that, you, you start to soften the expectations into something 
manageable. We lower the bar so that as long as we're generally good people, as long as we tend to give a lot to others and to charities, as long as on the whole we usually forgive people instead of taking revenge on them, well, we may not be perfect, but we're, we're mostly living up to the kind of people Jesus said we should be. Here's what I need you to see. Don't read this text as primarily a message about personal ethics. Read it as it's in its thrust as law and gospel. There's a law message, first of all. How impossible it is for us even to live in this world and measure up to the expectations of perfect love and generosity and mercy. None of us do it. And none of us can do it. You know, when I worked on my D-Min project, one of the areas that I had to study for my particular topic was how we live in a sinful society. And a great example of that came from life in Corinth in the New Testament era. If you were living in Corinth and you were Jewish or Christian in first century Corinth, it was impossible to live there without committing adultery. Why? Or, excuse me, without committing idolatry. Idolatry. Why? Because everything in the city was geared to the worship of the pagan gods. All the public facilities were named after the Greek gods or goddesses. So if you went to pay your taxes and you went into the tax house, you were going into the house of Zeus. If you went to the public baths, and they didn't have private baths right back then, right? If you took a bath, you had to go to the public bathhouse. The public bathhouse was dedicated to Aphrodite. So you had to go take a bath in Aphrodite's bathhouse. So the Jews devised some rules for living in society. And in the book of Corinthians, we see how Paul tweaks those rules a little bit for Christians who live there. And I wish I had time to give you all the details on that. It's fascinating. But the point for both of those was you just can't do everything. You try to do certain things, but ultimately you accept the ambiguity of the fact that you live in a sinful and fallen world. You're just not going to be able to do everything. The same is true for our day, isn't it? You know, I was thinking about this the other day. You cannot live in America in 2019 and not be a liar. Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm not a liar. Oh, yes, you are. Every one of you. Really? Sure. All of you have bank accounts. All of you have some kind of credit cards. All of you have computers where you have to download some kind of software. All of you have utility accounts, etc., etc., etc. All of those things, when you get them, what do they do? They give you some kind of statement of agreement. And before you can proceed on the computer, you have to check this little box, right, that says, I have read and accept the terms of the agreement. <laughs> if someone here has always stopped and read all of those terms, would you raise your hand? Oh, you see, we're all liars, aren't we? And if you've ever clicked on them and tried to read them, it's page after page of legalese that no one can understand. It's all designed to keep the lawyers employed and cover the behinds of the corporation. So you can't read all that stuff. So we all just click agree, right? We all accept the ambiguity that living in a sinful, fallen world, we're just not going to be able to do everything to the perfect ideal. And so when someone calls me up and says, Mr. Oswald, can we count on your support of $75? I say, no. <laughs> Am I doing right? Maybe not. Am I sinning? Maybe. But although I'm very generous on the whole, I know that my righteousness does not come from what I give. And my righteousness won't be augmented or helped out one bit by my giving more gifts or adding to my resume of good works and my charity. My righteousness comes from Christ. And that is the second thing we need to see about this text. That this text is, this sermon is ultimately a gospel message. Don't read it primarily as talking to you about your personal ethics. What you've got to see here is that when Jesus says, love your enemies, that you were God's enemy. Jesus loved you. When he says, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, what 
you've got to see here is that in your sinful state, you hated him. You cursed him. You abused him. And he has done good to you and blessed you and prayed for you. We struck him on the cheek and he has turned the other. We took his cloak and he gave up his tunic. We're the beggars to whom he gives. We're the borrowers to whom he lends, expecting nothing back. We're the ungrateful and the evil to whom he has been merciful. And the clues to this are right in the text. I'm not misreading it or imposing or reading upon this. He says in here, be merciful. Why? Because he has given us mercy. Calling attention to where the real locus of mercy lies. What Jesus has done for us. He says, don't judge. Why? Because we have not been judged. Like I said, if I thought you were stingy, or if I thought you were mean, or if I thought you were unforgiving people, maybe I would have preached more law today. But I think what we need to see in this text is the gospel. We should not be satisfied with our own righteousness. And we shouldn't even expect in this fallen, sinful, and broken world to be able to live righteousness, righteously. We, we need to keep our eyes on the one who gives us his righteousness, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you now to join me in confessing what all Christians believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray, Lord, with Joseph, the patriarch of old, who endured hardship and struggle and yet believed that you would bring about good. So bring all things to completion according to your wisdom and your purposes in us who trust in the new Adam, the one who has brought hope to the world and rescued us from sin and death, Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for your guidance amid a world that is filled with changes and chances. We ask that you would deliver us from doubt, and from paralysis of fear, that you would fill our hearts with great joy to know what Jesus has done for us and to experience the promise of his resurrection power so that we would not surrender to anxiety or despair. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, we pray for all pastors and missionaries, church workers and Christian teachers. We ask that you would lead them to be faithful in their service and to serve your people with compassion and love. We ask that you would bless all the places where we hear your word throughout the world. We particularly remember today our missionary that we support, Richard Wokema at the Lutheran Seminary in Nigeria. We ask that you would supply all of their needs, not only financially, but especially their spiritual needs in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for our civil authorities and all those that you have made responsible for the welfare of our nation and our state and our community. Help them to pursue faithfully what is right and good in your eyes. Help them protect and defend life from its beginning. We pray, Lord, that you would especially guard all first responders and that you would protect those who defend us both here and abroad. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And we ask, Lord, for your comfort upon all who suffer. We ask that you would deliver those who are sick according to your will and that you would sustain those who are troubled in body or in soul. Give them your grace. 
And Lord, we ask that you bring all things to completion in your own order and in your own good time. And we ask that when Christ comes, that you would grant us to be numbered among the saints in glory. And that one day when the last trumpet is blown and all the dead are raised imperishable and clothed with heavenly glory, so Lord, grant us to persevere in the faith that we might be among that number. We ask that you would give to us and to all the faithful the inheritance promised and an opportunity to share in the marriage feast of the Lamb and his eternal kingdom without end. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Finally, Lord, grant to us these and all good things, wholesome and profitable for our salvation, through the merits and mercies of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who in union with you and the Holy Spirit is one eternal God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.